Good day, and welcome to Epstein Becker Green and Provident Healthcare Partners webinar, Private Equity in Gastroenterology, Becoming a Platform, part of the Future of Healthcare Physician Practices and Private Equity Investments webinar series. Before we begin today's presentation, Please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed on mute throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx and at the end of the program, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. We are pleased to have two fantastic speakers today, Abe Mboji, an analyst at Provident Healthcare Partners, and Anjana Patel, member of the firm at Epstein Becker Green. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Abe Mboji. Hi everyone. Again, this is this is Abe and Boge. Uh, just to kind of get started here, we'll give a brief firm overview of Provident Healthcare Partners. So, we're a healthcare-focused investment bank that specializes in, in merger and acquisition advisory services as well as capital raising services to healthcare organizations. We've been around for about 20 years. And our firm of 22 banking professionals split between an East Coast office in Boston and a West Coast office in Los Angeles. We work on transactions around the country. And really within healthcare, I've carved out a nice niche nice niche within healthcare services, specifically on provider focused physician transactions, and I've done about thirty five deals since twenty fourteen. Um on the bottom right here you'll see some of our, our more notable transactions. And I'll let Anjana discuss a little bit about Epstein Becker Green. Thanks, Abe. Epstein Becker Green is a national firm. We've been around for over 40 years. We have about 250 lawyers across 14 offices throughout the U.S. And what makes us unique and unlike other national firms is that we are industry focused, primarily in the areas of healthcare and life sciences and labor and employment. And because of this unique focus, we represent clients in every sector and niche area of healthcare. So we have the depth and breadth expertise in all things healthcare. And of our 250 lawyers, um, 120 are in healthcare, of which 70 are healthcare transactional lawyers. So our lawyers have significant expertise um, leading major mergers, acquisitions, sales, and affiliations uh, on behalf of national healthcare companies, uh, PE backed portfolio companies, and local and regional healthcare providers. And uh, they're not only well versed in transactional matters, but because of our firm's unique focus, they're backed up by a broad, multidisciplinary team of attorneys who are experts in all things healthcare, like regulatory issues, antitrust, reimbursement, tax. And the list goes on. And with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Abe. Great. So to sort of set the stage here, I just want to cover some some brief goals for the presentation. Um, we want you all to come away with this pro uh, this presentation, understanding what is private equity, why is private equity interested in gastroenterology, and then what are some of the key transactional considerations in gastroenterology, and some regulatory considerations for these transactions in gastroenterology. So beginning with the section, what is private equity? Um, here we have a brief overview of private equity. What is it? Um, they are institutional investors that raise these capital, these pools of capital um, with the aim to invest in, in high quality businesses within the funds industries of expertise that can, they can then leverage those expertise to grow the businesses both organically from a de novo perspective as well as through acquisitions. What they want to do is maintain the management and partner with good management in place and then provide strategic support around high-level decisions. In addition, they want to provide financial resources for acquisitions and internal investment while you, leveraging their capital markets expertise to optimize the, the capital structure of the business. Their goals and incentives, the funds are really aiming to create a return on their invested equity of about three to four times with an investment time horizon of about three to seven years. And moving on to the next section, uh, what is the private equity investment strategy? So um, first and foremost, once they've invested in what you would call a platform organization, they're going to want to refine the internal infrastructure and establish the growth objectives for the organization. Um, by refining the internal infrastructure, they want to 
partner with a platform organization and the level at which each, each organization begins an investment horizon is always different. But to the extent that they can invest in the, the infrastructure to create more capacity for that business. So the, the organization may be able to support 50 physicians right now. They want to have an, uh, an infrastructure in place that can support 100, 150 and bring more providers and additional providers onto that platform. Once that infrastructure is in place, they want to establish the key growth objectives for that business. How are we going to grow? Within gastroenterology, are we going to go and open up other surgery centers? Are we going to acquire other groups onto our uh, platform? Are we going to launch other ancillary services, such as a pathology lab or specialty pharmacy? And once that vision has been established, they're going to look to consolidate the market both locally and regionally. And so it, it, I'm sure a lot of you on the line may be aware, but Gastro Health down in South Florida was the first gastroenterology organization to partner with a private equity firm last year in 2016 with Audex Group. Um, this is very much the stage of the pyramid where they would be at in terms of consolidating their market locally. They've leveraged the resources of Audex Group to complete seven add-on acquisitions in 2017 alone. And once you've kind of consolidated your back market, um, backyard market, they're going to look to establish new regional hubs around around the country or in other geographies. And the strategy is different for every transa uh, tra transaction. Um, a lot of times you'll see big regional plays where they'll con condense a, a large region of, of the country or they can establish hubs in different uh, geographic spheres around the country. And after that's kind of been done, they're going to look to explore an exit. Usually we see firms in, in – trading hands with other private equity investors who will look to, to ramp up the acquisitive growth of that business and continue the same strategy going forward. And so you're asking, how does the equity value appreciate in these organizations over the long term? Um, the first is through synergy. So again, it goes back to that, that first base level of the pyramid. There are two sides to synergies, cost synergies and revenue synergies. So from a cost perspective, if you have an infrastructure in place that you can then utilize excess capacity to bring additional providers onto your platform by consolidating back office functions, HR functions, IT functions, accounting functions. You're able to use those other providers and cut costs out of their organizations and make them more profitable under your umbrella. Within gastroenterology, one of the biggest opportunities, though, comes from the revenue synergy side of the equation. Uh, what's interesting about gastroenterology is that the wide breadth of ancillary services allows for groups to partner with an organization that has more ancillary services than that of themselves. So if you look at GastroHealth, using them as an example, they have a wide breadth of, of these ancillary services offerings from specialty pharmacy, surgery centers, offering anesthesia, pathology, infusion. Um, for a small organization that can then partner with them, the smaller provider is able to offer better breadth of services to their patients, and GastroRel is able to make those organizations more profitable under those, their umbrella. So that's one of the most important things within gastroenterology. Um, again, this also relates sort of to the infrastructure. They're going to want to bolster the management team of that business. So right now, a lot of gastro organizations will have a CEO, maybe a COO, maybe even a CFO, and let's say they're managing 50 to 75 physicians. Do we have the management in place to manage 100, 150, hopefully 200 physicians at the end of the, the life cycle of the transaction? So putting strategic management in place that these private equity firms have relationships with and other clinics, clinically based businesses can really help bolster that. Um, again, expanding ancillaries. This goes back to the synergies within GI. It's, it's critical that as you, you become a platform, you build out other ancillary services so that you can offer the, the best quality of care to your patients possible. And then the concept of multiple arbitrage. Um, in terms of valuation within gastroenterology, being a first mover, there's a lot of benefit to that because a first mover with private equity capital will be the only buyer in town for a lot of organizations in, the, in their reg respective regional markets. And so what that means is you as the, the platform will receive a valuation for sake of example, we'll call it 10. And you're going to go out and acquire other organizations on your platform and you're going to pay five or six for these smaller groups. As the, the, the overall organization grows throughout the life cycle of that transaction, the cash flow and the stability of those cash flows in that platform organization increases, and therefore at the end of the transaction, you'll actually probably receive a higher multiple, call it 12. Um, every acquisition that you went and made it four, five, and six times earnings exits the investment at the same time with the platform at that 12 times EBITDA. So what happens is there's a big accretion to the equity shareholders in that organization as a result of that arbitrage. And moving on here, 
here's some past examples of, of private equity roll-up successes, and, and these are all former Provident clients um, in the dental space, which was really one of the first segments within physician services to see consolidation. Uh, we represented Great Expressions Dental Centers in a private equity recapitalization with Audax Group in 2008. Um, that organization went on as a result of that partnership to become one of the largest uh, dental service organizations within the country. On ophthalmology in, in 2014, we represented an organization called Cats and Eye Group, which is based in Maryland, um, through a private equity recapitalization with Varsity Healthcare Partners. That organization is now known as Eye Care Services Partners and is one of the largest providers of ophthalmology services in the country. Um, in 2011, we represented the Spine Center through a, re a recapitalization with Sentinel Capital Partners. Um, that organization is now known as National Spine and Pain Centers and is one of the largest interventional pain management providers in the country with a dominant presence on the, in the Mid-Atlantic. And most recently, this year, we represented the Women's Healthcare Group of Pennsylvania through a recapitalization with Audax Group, the first investment into the OBGYN sector. And this transaction was a little interesting because as, as a result of the transaction, um, they were subsequently merged with Regional Women's Health Group, which was another group in New Jersey, and created Axia Women's Health, which is now going to be the largest provider of OBGYN care services in the country. So moving on to the next section here. Why is private equity interested in gastroenterology? So it, a lot of it are trends that stem from um, the, the basic demand around these clinic-based, uh, you know, outsourced physician services, outpatient physician services. And at a high level here, you know, the, the demographic is very attractive within the United States right now. Um, with, with a growing population, age 65 and over, um, you know, one of the first things people do after they, they become age 50 is go and get a colonoscopy. So gastroenterology services are just poised to benefit from, from that aging demographic in the United States. And moving on, the shift to the outpatient care setting, this is important within gastroenterology based on how surgical it is. So there's been a big shift as, as the, in the healthcare environment has moved towards this value-based med med medicine system. And really, it's, care is a lot less expensive in the outpatient setting. So there's been a, a big demand shift for inpatient care in the hospital to the outpatient setting. And what's happened here on the right, you can see outpatient spending increasing versus the inpatient spending. Um, and what that's done is that's driven a lot of investment from the private equity community into the clinic and outpatient setting. So to the left, you can kind of see that how investment is really skyrocketed. And moving on here. There's also been a huge emphasis on quality of services. So continuing off, off the last slide, um, you have rising outpatient procedural volumes in the ASC-based setting. Um, as you can see, it's increased greatly from 1993 to 2014. And with about one-fourth of all GI cases being, uh, uh, one-fourth of all ASC cases being gastrointestinal, um, gastroenterology is poised to benefit from that as well. And as um, spending overall within physician services has really increased greatly, um, but provide, um, payers and in, in the, the healthcare system are looking for more value out of these, these physicians and these practices. And what that's meaning is that these smaller providers are having to invest in, in EMR technology and IT technology and, and quality reporting measures um, to be able to effectively satisfy all the new requirements. This is very expensive to do. And it's becoming very burdensome to, to manage a practice administratively. So what you're having is a lot of these organizations are partnering with these groups, these larger organizations like GastroHealth. It's, it's very easy for a small provider to plug into that platform and leverage all the technology and administrative infrastructure that's in place. And moving on. So this is perhaps the biggest opportunity within gastroenterology, um, and it's the fragmentation of the market. So what you have here is a map of the United States with a key to the, to the left that shows in each state how many gastroenterology organizations there are with over 20 doctors. And you can kind of see there, there are two important points to make um, based on this, this chart. So you can see down in Florida, Florida is one of the, the, the most consolidated markets from an overall perspective in terms of fragmentation within gastroenterology. So there are several large organizations down in Florida, GastroHealth being one, Digestive Care is another one in South Florida, Florida Digestive Health Specialist and, and Borland Groover Clinic. Um, what GastroHealth has done as a result of their partnership has leveraged the resources of, of Audax Group to really go in and create more density down in that marketplace and really separate itself from some of its other competitors down in that market. Um, so 
there's an opportunity for organizations in you know Texas and Florida, Ohio, or, or where there's where there's other groups to use those resources to set yourself apart for some of the competitors in your market. And then in some of these other markets where there's one and, and a lot there's zero. In fact, in 24 states there's there's uh, a lacking of an independent gastro practice over 20 doctors. And so there's an opportunity there to become the platform organization within your respective state or geography, leveraging the resources to go out and acquire, you know, three, four, five smaller organizations in, in, the, in, the, in the area within those respective states and become that dominant platform. Moving on here. And so where have we seen this in other specialties? So. Consolidation really began in dental in the late 1990s, and you know, fast forward to today, there are about 35 private equity-backed portfolio companies. Pain management is the same thing. Um, 2008, there are now six today. Dermatology, 2011, there are 21. Ophthalmology is very similar. Um, 2014, now there's 11. So this this is just a scale from from more mature um, visit se segments of physician services, and you can see the general theme where these segments down here at the bottom, gastroenterology, urology, OBGYN, and, and orthopedics, they're they're in their infancy in terms of private equity interest and in investment in the sector. But based on what we've seen within these other specialties, um, you know, we expect a lot more investment and, and private equity interest to, to follow. And so moving on to to the next section. What, what are the key considerations for a transaction in gastroenterology? So what are these transactions based on? Um, they're based on what's called a multiple of adjusted EBITDA. Um, and the valuation for the group will be based on this number and a multiple of that figure. So if, if, for an example, just to keep it simple, if a group had $5 million in EBITDA and received an 8, million, eight times multiple, and that'd be a $40 million valuation. And the exact multiple that, that groups are willing to pay is, is different for every organization. It's based on you know size of the organization, what kind of ancillary services are they offering, um, what geography is it in, what does the historical growth profile for that business look like over the long term. And then there are two, type, two main types of transaction structures, minority versus majority. Um, in a majority transaction, a private equity firm will come in and purchase over 50% of the equity of the business and the, the current physicians will re retain a generally a minority stake in the organization. And that compared to a minority transaction where a private equity firm will buy a minority stake in the business, so under 50%. And there's generally a, a valuation premium placed on the a majority transaction for, for the control aspect, um, as well as some liquidity constraints um, in a minority transaction. Also rollover equity. So as I mentioned, in, in the majority deal, um, the private equity firm will, will purchase a majority position, but physician practice transactions are very unique from general business transactions where the value of the organization is tied up in the positions of, of the, the practice. If the position is left overnight, then there's no value anymore. There, there will be no collections. There will be no patients. So they want to ensure that everyone is aligned in terms of their objectives going forward. And generally, we see that private equity firms want physicians to maintain anywhere from 20 to 40 percent equity in the company on, on a go-forward basis. And the, the fourth most important point is that there's a lot of flexibility in these transactions. No two transactions are ever exactly alike. Um, so in terms of you know structuring things like earnouts to get groups credit for growth that they're planning to experience, or getting more more cash at close versus um, you know everything like that. And, and in terms of uh, physicians and, and daily control as well as cl clinic uh, clinical decisions are very important considerations. And, and there's just a lot of flexibility around things like that. Uh, moving on to kind of discuss what exactly is EBITDA. So EBITDA is the earnings of a business before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, we add back the interest due to the assumption that any debt the organization has on its balance sheet currently will be paid off as part of a transaction. And it also frees up the business from any capital structure decisions that are being made currently um, from a valuation perspective. Taxes are added, added back due to the change in tax structure as a result of the transaction. And depreciation and amortization are added back just due to the non-cash nature of those expenses. They're not indicative of the actual cash flow of the business. And EBITDA is a proxy for the cash flow of the business. Um, taking that a step further, these deals are done on what's called a multiple of adjusted EBITDA. So adjusted EBITDA is just EBITDA adjusted for any non-recurring expenses that the business are, is going to 
has experienced, um, as well as generally the biggest add back is a normalization of shareholder compensation. Um, in the, these physician transactions and in, in these physician businesses, um, the owner, the shareholders of that business are generally taking an above market distribution at the end of the year. And so adding that back down to a market rate will create uh, the foundation for adjusted EBITDA in a lot of practices as well as these non, uh, non-recurring non one-time expenses. Uh, things that are pretty common are, are legal expenses or, or consulting expenses for a big project, perhaps even um, upfront capital investments on any projects that the group has put in, like a surgery center or something like that. I'm moving on to the next section. So what are some of the motivations to pursue a transaction? Um, number one, access to capital, um, being able to leverage sort of like an in-house investment bank with a private equity partner to finance and structure and source these acquisitions has been pretty attractive to a lot of these groups in terms of leveraging that to scale and grow their business with professionals that understand how to scale and grow a, a medical organization that, and leverage their experience in other sectors to do so. Um, they can provide the investments necessary in the infrastructure to grow, whether that be investing in the IT technology, building out a comprehensive billing staff, um, hiring the supplemental management, as we discussed earlier, putting uh, working capital in the business for de novo growth. Um, also, there's, there's great resources that come with a partnership. As you become a large organization, you can, you can strengthen your leverage from contract negotiations with payers. Um, you get the ex expertise necessary to, to um, grow the business through an acquisitive growth strategy. Um, and by increasing the size and scale, you're offered to offer, uh, you're able to offer a better quality of care to, to the patients and, and, and offering a wider breadth of services in, in a wider geographic area. And then some of the key shareholder considerations. Um, risk mitigation has definitely been a big one. Um, the, the capital investments and debt of the business will no longer be personally guaranteed by the shareholders of the business. Um, valuations right now are at an all-time high within the markets. Uh, we, we really don't see them going up from here. Um, we don't see them going down. It's more, it's more of a plateau. But that's been a pretty compelling reason for a lot of groups to monetize equity during a period where, you know, operational and financial business risks uh, could be un uncontrollable in the future. And when you look at reimbursement for a lot of these groups and, and a lot of these specialties, you know, the long-term reimbursement outlook, um, in best case, it's stable, right? And, and no one would tell you that reimbursement is going to go up over the long term. So. The ability to monetize equity in a market like that has been key to a lot of physicians. And then liquidity events. There's obviously in these transactions a large upfront cash payment to shareholders, um, and shareholders are going to retain a piece of equity in that business so they get the upside potential of the growth in their organization as it, as it becomes a, a national or super regional platform. And the opportunity exists for multiple liquidity events as there are subsequent private equity transactions. Uh, there's the opportunity to continue on with the business as it continues to grow or, uh, you know, sell out more liquidity as, as throughout the life stage of the transaction. And moving on, what is the ideal candidate for private equity? So what, is the, what do private equity firms look for in a platform organization? Um, number one, it all starts back with the base of that pyramid. They want a strong internal infrastructure. So do they have consolidated billing, finance, financial functions, IT functions, HR functions? Can that platform support excess providers within itself? Is there excess capacity there that, that we can scale up and leverage and help um, grow that business? And point two is, is there a strong management team in place? Does management have a, a really grand vision for the organization? Um, are they somebody that understands where healthcare is going and, and how can they grow this business and, and you know, what is their, what's going to be their vision to do so? And then three, within um, GI, again, very important uh, ancillary services. Are they offering the, the wide breadth of services to patients to be able to capture all, all that additional revenue, but off, also be able to offer that better quality of service through providing anesthesia, having surgery centers, pathology lab, infusion center, especially pharmacy. Even within GI, we've seen some groups do nutritional, have nutritional aspects as well. And then uh, last, the last thing I'll touch on on this page, and probably perhaps one of the most important is, is do they have a strong uh, reputation within the, the gastroenterology community? Um, at the end of the day, you know, these, these deals, they, they want to build a platform that other gastroenterology groups and providers are going to respect, and how are they going to grow it into the largest organization possible? And the way you do that is by partnering with groups that have the strongest reputations in the community that other pro providers will respect and will want to go and, and, and be a part of. So moving on. 
And in choosing the right partner, um, you know, number one, you want to understand what, what is the investment approach and strategy of the private equity firm. You know, they're they're very different in terms of their their approaches to to their their management of their portfolio companies. Some are, some are very hands on, some are very hands off, and will only be active on the board. So it's, it's very important to just understand that because um, you're going to be building a working relationship with them going forward. And what other what other related portfolio company experience can they leverage? Um, you know, have they done this in dermatology? Have they done this in ophthalmology? Other sectors that share very similar traits to gastroenterology, and they can leverage those experiences in terms of learning how to integrate uh, medical practices together and grow them throughout that process in a comprehensive manner. Um, what relationships can they leverage and bring to the table? It's, it's very important because every private equity firm can bring capital to the table. That's, that's very easy to do. They have a, a, a large pool of, of capital. But how, what relationships do they have that they can leverage within those other portfolio companies that they have and with other operating partners um, throughout the healthcare system that they can use to, to grow that organization? And cultural fit and personality is also key. Throughout our transaction processes, you're getting to know these private equity firms. You're, getting, you're going to dinner with them. You're sitting down with them. You're discussing. Um, you're going to need to both agree on a vision for the business going forward. And if they, you know, they need to agree with the, the, the platform organization, the platform organization needs to agree with them. So understanding each other and how, the, how you're going to build that working relationship going forward is key to success in these partnerships. Moving forward here. In terms of structuring the deal for all shareholders, so it's very important to understand that um, one thing we've learned throughout our transactional experience in working with pretty large shareholder bases, which is very common within gastroenterology, is a lot of these regional um, large organizations in, in GI have, have come together through mergers, is that there are very different motivations within within a shareholder base in towards getting a transaction done. So it, when, when it comes to the rollover equity component, you know, one thing we see is that there's, there's, there can be some conflict between the, the later stage partners and, and the earlier career partners. Um, and the way we've kind of figured out how to solve this is the rollover equity component, that 20 to 40 percent that you roll over into the organization going forward, um, in aggregate, that needs to be the same. But how you split it up amongst the physicians in the, in the organization, there is a lot of flexibility there. And so what we found is that later career partners generally will like to um, – realize more liquidity at the closing of that transaction as they're closer to retirement and, and you know, take more chips off the table. And those younger physicians will want to retain more of that upside and offer the chance and, and take advantage of the chance to participate in multiple uh, transactions down the line. Um, as far as cash at closing, it allows those later partners to diversify their wealth before retirement and allows younger younger physicians to retire any medical debt that they may have out of, coming out of school and put that capital to work in other investments, personal investments that they may have. Um, the post-closing compensation, so with later career partners, really it's very flexible there in terms of stepping into whatever role is, is desired. Um, we've seen some presidents of organizations want to become the, the chief business development officer of the organization, so they're more focused on going out and generating business for the organization, or they just want to continue practicing medicine until they're, they're, they're ready to retire. And as far as early partners, um, generally we'll, we'll see them on a productivity-based uh, compensation model with bonuses tied to the ASC and ancillary income. And then as far as lifestyle benefits, um, through, through a transaction, it allows the older partners to um, kind of go through a transitory period as they transfer themselves towards this retirement and allows younger physicians to really just focus on practicing medicine and, and relieve some of the stress and, and uh, risk as an owner of that business. And it allows all partners to really um, you know, use that investor's capital instead of personal guarantees to finance the growth of that business, whether that be putting out capital for new surgery centers and, and things like that. And Anjana will discuss some of the key regulatory considerations for these transactions. Thanks, Abe. So from the legal and regulatory perspective, I'm going to cover uh, basically three main topics. Um, number one, what is the due diligence process and why is that important to private equity buyers. Um, secondly, what are some of the common regulatory issues um, unique to physician practices and more specifically unique to GI practices? And then number three, you know, how do you prepare for these transactions from a regulatory compliance perspective and just general housekeeping cleanup? And then I'm going to leave a few minutes at the end for questions. So um, moving on, what is due diligence? 
as Abe noted in his presentation, the definition of private equity is, you know, these are the firms who use other people's capital to invest in assets in order to get above market returns. So, right, if you have private equity, you know, firms paying tens of millions of dollars, you know, multiple, 10 or 15 multiples of EBITDA, um, sometimes even nine-figure purchase price of someone else's money, um, then you can appreciate that they will really want to take a, a deep dive and, uh, into the seller's, you know, practice, you know, really do a comprehensive review of the, of the assets, the liabilities, the operations. Um, and part of the, the due diligence uh, review and request will be asking for the, the seller's financial records, um, you know, PLI statements, billing claims, they're going to look at the ARs, um, and essentially do something called a quality of earnings review. Um, and, and that's why, you know, it's very important um, for uh, private equity buyers, you know, because they, if the quality of earnings is solid, then that's usually the green light to go forward with the transaction. Um, their legal team is also wanna, going to want to look at the organizational documents, the shareholders agreement, bylaws, things like that. They want to identify any major liabilities, whether it's from litigation, investigations, uh, peer audits, um, and also take a look at the material contracts of the practice, right? So the peer contracts, um, the peer mix, how diverse it is, uh, employment agreements with referring physicians and things like that. And from a legal perspective, they're looking at all these um, due diligence materials because one of the things that they want to appreciate and understand is what level of success or liability they might inherit. Um, so in certain circumstances, depending on how the transaction is structured, the buyer may potentially inherit some of the liabilities of the seller. So they want to understand that, they want to be able to quantify that. Um, the emphasis will be on healthcare billing and compliance um, and referral arrangements, um, just because that is the world we live in and there's a lot of government scrutiny, peer scrutiny, a lot of whistleblower actions um, around, around these topics. And so that's going to be a, a key major area of focus. And, you know, they want to understand and appreciate how major legal and compliance issues will impact uh, the sustainability of revenues and, and, and like Abe said, the practice's wow. reputation. So moving on, some of the uh, common regulatory issues um, when it comes to GI transactions uh, is coding and billing. This is going to be part of the due diligence review. This is a major focus and also uh, fraud and abuse compliance, whether it's the anti-kickback statute or the Stark Law, um, and specifically the Stark Law because it is a strict liability law with um, potentially harsh financial penalties for noncompliance. They'll also want to undertake a review of all the compensation and other financial arrangements, uh, whether amongst the physicians within the practice or with, you know, outside vendors um, and especially with hospitals. And, and then also want to take a look at the existence and, impl and implementation of the practice's compliance program. So moving on, some of the sort of common um, billing and coding problems for physician practices in general and includes GI. You know, number one is always has always been medical necessity and having appropriate documentation, right? So making sure that um, the, the medical charts you know, properly reflect all the history, the assessment, um, and all of that. And then also making sure that uh, procedures are not overutilized uh, as compared to industry norms. So looking at the utilization review, and then um, something that's also unique to GI in some ways is, is this whole issue of unbundling, um, you know, is the practice billing for, let's say, certain types of anesthesia services separately when it should be really bundled into the GI procedure codes. So moving on, some of the sort of more specific billing and coding problems uh, with GI practices you know, really stem from the fact that a lot of these practices offer multiple services. So a lot of um, GI groups are offering infusion services, for example. And the issue with infusion services, number one, is that uh, several of the Medicare Max are looking carefully to see if, you know, an E&M code is uh, a visit is being billed on the same day as an in infusion service. And so it's really critical that the documentation appropriately reflects the current modifier um, so that that doesn't happen. And then the other issue with infusion is 
is Remicade and the fact that, you know, the FDA's approved some biosimilars. And, and so the billing really needs to be uh, tip top in order to ensure that you've got the appropriate acquisition costs reflected, because obviously those would be less um, than for biosimilars and for Remicade. Pathology is obviously another um, important component of a lot of GI practices. And here the issue is medical necessity and making sure that, you know, the documentation reflects why special stains or samples are required. Anesthesia is also very commonly um, built into GI practices these days. And, you know, the issue here is making sure that you're using correct billing units um, in, in, uh, in what you're, in the services being provided. ASCs, um, a lot of practices have them built in or are joint ventured in, in one or two or several ASCs. And the issue here is making sure that correct uh, diagnosis codes are, are used, like for example, when placing a, a device to monitor acid or something like that. And um, if it's not on the CMS approved list, then you know it may be denied. And the other issue with, with these devices is you know making sure the billing staff understands when the device is actually placed versus when the data from the device is retrieved and 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 read, and uh, making sure you get those dates uh, correct. Other diagnostic tests, one thing to be careful about is a lot of uh, GI practices hire outside companies, for example, to read data from capsule endoscopies and things like that. And, um, you know, there, there's a rule, CMS has a rule called the anti-markup rule, which really limits um, how the GI practice can bill for these types of purchase services. Uh, moving on, some future uh, potential future billing problem areas. Um, we're seeing a trend with a lot of GI practices getting into weight loss procedures. And, you know, the issue here is making sure um, that the procedures that are being performed are, in fact, what are covered by the, by the payer. Um, we're seeing issues where, you know, a certain type of procedure is not paid for by, let's say, CMS. Um, or is paid for by CMS, but the actual procedure done it is different and built for. Medication administration, um, we're seeing issues here where, for example, you, is a Remicade uh, vial and it's not, all of it is not used. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you're billing accurately for, for the actual amount of usage. Um, a lot of groups have um, sort of branched into trying to, into incorporating pharmacies, you know, to dispense certain types of uh, specialty drugs. So that's a potential area where, you know, payers are, are going to look into the, the billing and coding. And then lastly, what we're seeing, or we think we're going to see actually within the next year is um, when the FDA, if the FDA uh, approves two drugs to treat um, non-alcoholic fatty liver, uh, issues, there, there might possibly be need for invasive pathology or an ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis before the payer actually will uh, approve for the drug for payment. So we see uh, potential there for um, billing and coding scrutiny. Moving on um, to some of the legal issues that kind of arise in these transactions. Um, number one tends to be the Stark Law and, and the equivalent state um, state law that pro prohibits self-referral pro between uh, physicians and, and entities in which they have financial interests. And the reason Stark tends to be high on the priority list is um, if the practice is involved in providing certain types of what they call designated health services like pathology, imaging, inpatient, outpatient services, certain medical devices, then the Stark law potentially applies. And because it's a strict liability law, which means you have to meet every element of the of the law's requirements, and if you don't, um, there is a potential draconian penalty for noncompliance. It tends to be high on the radar of, of a buyer's due diligence concern. And the Stark Law essentially, like I said, prohibits physicians from making referrals for these designated health services like pathology and imaging to entities in which they or their family member might have a financial interest unless uh, they can qualify for an exception. And there, there are exceptions that are unique to physician practices, uh, in particular something called the in-office ancillary services exception and the physician services exception. Um, but to qualify for these exceptions, the group actually has to be something called a group practice. And that's a 
it's a very specific definition under the Stark Law. It has about 10 or 12 requirements, and um, but but it is if you meet that re the definition of group practice, then you will have immunity potentially from the Stark Law. Moving on, um, and and uh, the Stark Law diligence concerns, you know, it, it really whether the group meets the group practice definition because. It really is helpful for GI practices to be bona fide group practices because a lot of them, like I said, have not only multiple physicians, but they have, offer multiple um, ancillary services. And the group practice def, uh, rules actually uh, permit more leeway in how a group can compensate or share revenues from certain types of ancillaries that are covered by the Stark Law. Uh, so it is quite beneficial for the group to meet that, um, and if it meets that, then it would potentially qualify for an exception. Um, on the flip side, if it can't meet those requirements, um, let's say, for example, uh, one of the requirements is that uh, the physicians in the group must spend at least 75% of their time um, practicing and billing through the group. So if you have a group with multiple providers that are spread through multiple groups, um, billing through multiple groups, they may not meet the, the group practice definition. Uh, if that's the case, then you really want to try to meet another stock law exception. And then if that's not possible, then, uh, you know, the buyer is going to want to assess what are the potential liabilities um, involved. On the next slide, um, one of the other areas that private equity buyers uh, focused on when they're looking at the due diligence is how are the shareholders of the group, how are the employees, how are the mid-levels paid. For example, if bonuses are based on personally performed services, then that's usually a good thing. Um, so they want to look at that. They also want to examine the relationships between the group and third parties like vendors, uh, management of billing companies that are you know, doing certain types of things like marketing, hospitals, and also other referral uh, sources. And in general, you know, if as long as these arrangements are in writing, they're signed by the party, the compensation terms of fair market value and commercially reasonable, the compliance uh, risk tends to be low. And the buyer wants to identify, you know, as part of this review of these relationships, you know, what, what amount of this business for the, for the GI practice is tainted, perhaps, because the referral source is getting paid in a way that um, is, you know, against the rules, which is against the foreign abuse laws. And as a result of that, they then also want to identify um, not only what, what is tainted, but also what, what the potential liabilities are, uh, whether it's to the government or to a payer, and then trying to quantify that and then also understand or have an appreciation of how that's going to affect revenues and profits uh, going forward. So moving on, with respect to other areas of focus in due diligence, um, arrangements with hospitals and ASCs are also kind of particular to GI practices. And, you, you know, there's different types of arrangements. They could be medical directorships. They could be um, rentals of space and equipment. Um, and the issue is whether, you know, services or items are being provided for below fair market value in order to reward referrals or for free. Um, for example, we've seen cases where a hospital will provide staff to a GI practice um, at no charge. So that would be a potentially uh, problematic arrangement under these uh, foreign abuse laws. With surgery centers, um, the issue tends to be whether, you know, there's compliance with the anti-kickback law, safe harbors for ASCs, whether specifically the one-third or the two one-third rules are being complied with, and then, you know, what happens to non-compliant physicians, are they, um, how do you deal with those? Other diligence concerns in general from a legal perspective, looking at contracts, looking at restrictive covenants in employment agreements and in other contracts, seeing what the scope of those are, um, you know, how that might play into when the buyer, you know, wants to expand from the platform from, from the original acquisition to other acquisitions, um, also change of control and assignment prohibitions. Usually we see a lot of these issues come up in uh, space leases, especially when the GI practice doesn't own um, the building or the location where they're at. Uh, these 
leases oftentimes prohibit um, a change of control or an assignment, and that usually leads to you know extensive discussion sometimes with landlords, and um, you know it, it it all kind of works out at the end, but it, you know that just needs to be factored into the timeline for the transaction. Moving on, the 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 other thing that is going to be of increasing focus in these transactions is really the extent of uh, that the GI practice has a compliance program, um, but not only has it, but is you know truly and fully implementing it, because there's nothing worse than having you know the paperwork, a compliance program that's stuck in someone's desk drawer and that has never been implemented. It, it's almost better not to have that that you know paperwork in the first place. And, and the focus will be on policy, you know, reviewing the policies and procedures, but really kind of looking to see you know, what were the past areas of concern and, and what was really done by the practice to remedy that and to make sure that it, you know, it doesn't happen again. And one of the increasing areas of focus is definitely uh, privacy and security, um, not only HIPAA, but just in general privacy and security uh, compliance, you know, as, as more and more cyber hacking um, is, is occurring with medical, in the medical industry, in the, in the healthcare industry in general. Uh, one of the things they will look at is whether the GI practice has purchased cyber insurance um, as a way to mitigate some of the risk. So moving on, so how do you prepare for a private equity transaction? And, and the key takeaway here is really uh, get your house in order. You know, it really, really makes a difference to, um, before you engage in a transaction, or even discussions, Take a good hard look at the practice, um, identify problematic areas, try to resolve them because what if if this is not kind of done, uh, what happens is that these issues come up during negotiations. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, it tends to prolong the timeline for the deal. It, it, you know it, it, it's expensive frankly, for the GI practice because lawyers will be involved, you know, consultants will be involved, et cetera. So it, it's really important to get your house in order up front. And, you know, you should already be kind of doing, doing part of that as part of your compliance efforts, you know, identifying problematic areas, whether it's regulatory risk or some other type of risk, making sure you're monitoring these issues, you know, fixing them going forward. Um, and, and most importantly, you should not try to conceal potential compliance issues um, and violations in due diligence. We've had transactions um, in the past where, you know, a seller would say, oh, that we just discovered this, it's terrible, we won't tell the buyer. I mean, that is something you don't want to do. Um, and there are ways to kind of deal with these potential compliance issues, you know, whether it's through, you know, the confidentiality agreement that the parties sign up front or, you know, there's something called a common interest agreement, which is really an, an agreement that, it, that could um, extend the attorney-client privilege to both sides. So there's ways to deal with that if, if it's very sensitive. Um, sometimes you could deal with it in the purchase agreement through indemnification, through escrows and holdbacks. And sometimes you can actually fix the problem. Like, for example, if it's a, um, a Stark Law violation, like a technical violation of the Stark Law where a signature is missing or something like that, CMS actually has a self-disclosure protocol, which, you know, as of which they actually revised earlier this year and has have made it much more streamlined and very sort of easy to, to, to comply with. So you could actually submit through that protocol and, and get, like, um, basically a cleanup of, of the violations. So with that, um, I think I will open it up to questions. Um, please submit questions to the chat feature, like Whitney mentioned at the start. So the first question, this is a, uh, the first question is how involved in day-to-day -day life is the private equity firm? So this is important. This is something that, that uh, kind of comes up a lot in, in discussions with other clients. Um, the first thing that's important to understand is that private equity firms are uh, professional investors. They are not um, professional day-to-day -day operators of a clinical practice. And so that's why it, it, it's so key that they partner with a management and, that has a vision and 
with a, a, a clinical practice that has an outstanding brand. Um, just they want to be more involved in terms of high-level strategic businesses, um, business decisions, um, not as far as, you know, how to treat patients, um, you know, what is the best way to uh, bring on other clinical practices to the, to the, to the platform, you know, we the, generally the physicians will actually have final say in terms of whether or not a, a group is a good clinical fit with the uh, the private equity organization. So uh, it's very hands off, very at a very much a strategic level, uh, to, and they want to partner with operators that that have experience and an understanding of how to operate at a granular level within their own industry. So the next question. Um, is how long do these transactions take from start to finish on average? So, I, I mean, I'll take a stab at that first, Abe, and then maybe you have an opinion too. But, you know, from my perspective, what we've seen is that, you know, it, it depends. Um, a lot of it is, like I said, if, if the house is in order, if the, you know, the compliance, there you know, are major compliance issues, um, there are no regulatory issues. Uh, then, you know, the deal usually moves faster. But I think that, you know, the due diligence phase is really what drives the timeline because once the quality of earnings and financial due diligence is complete, I think there's a lot more comfort level from the private equity buyer, you know, moving forward. And then, you know, going through the due diligence and, and identifying any major, you know, legal compliance issues, once you cross those hurdles, um, I think everything moves much more faster. And, you know, we've seen deals that take six weeks, and we've seen deals that take four months. Four months. So, you know, it, it just depends. And absolutely, I, I would co uh, corroborate what, what Anjana said, is that um, you know, these deals take on a life of their own, and then they can certainly take a long time, and there's a lot of consideration that, that needs to go into the transaction. We have another one. What is the value add of private equity for physicians who do not need private equity capital to grow their practice? Um, so this is also a, another thing that comes up quite a bit um, in discussions with, with prospective clients and, and clients as well. Um, really, the value add that, that private equity brings to the, to, the, to the table is a lot more than just capital. I mean, they they have experience growing and, and scaling these organizations within other uh, multi-site clinic-based physician service businesses, and they bring that those expertise and relationships to the table within these transactions. Um, you know, we talk to a lot of physician groups and they'll say, you know, we, we don't need capital, um, and, and that's great, but how are you going to go and, and scale this business? Do you, do you know how to do that? Um, and, and some may, um, but in reality, the private equity firms just bring a lot more expertise in terms of optimizing the capital structure of the business, financing acquisitions, um, sourcing acquisitions, how do we integrate two medical practices on, a, on and, and effectively scale the business, as well as leveraging, you know, other portfolio company experience and relationships that they may have. Um, they may have, you know, a relationship with a, a, a specific medical supplier with all of their portfolio companies that allows them to get a better rate than any other, you know, they could on their own with even a large platform. By having three large platforms, able to, to take advantage of things like that. So just leveraging their relationships and, and things like that really is, is what's most important, and that's something you'll want to evaluate uh, independent of each private equity partner throughout the transaction process. This is another one. What is the single most important step that a company can take to make sure that they are ready for a transaction? Uh, again, it goes back to, to what Anjana said. I'm at least my perspective. I'm sure she has a perspective on this as well, and she, she definitely hit on it during her presentation. Um, and making sure that the house is in order, um, understanding that this is something that um, you know, the, the shareholder base wants to pursue. And what we often find in working with groups is that at the beginning there, there's a little skepticism and, and uh, not a full understanding in terms of, um, you know, why this might be for the organization. And our role with a lot of our clients has been uh, serving as an educator in terms of that process to both uh, the, the leadership of organizations as well as the respective shareholders of groups. Um, the, the women's health care transaction that I mentioned earlier, I mean, that was a shareholder base of about 66 uh, doctors. So um, we went through a, a robust education process throughout that transaction to um, have everyone on board uh, with bringing in a, a private equity partner to that business. So just making sure that, that everyone is 
aware and understands the benefits of, of doing this and that that gets everyone excited about about the future of the business so just getting everyone on the same page is my perspective yeah and to add to that Abe you know I think you're absolutely right it's understanding the process on you know being educated about the process because you know that you know, we've found sets expectations. Um, you know, a lot of these practices have never done anything like this. They've never engaged in this, you know, once in a lifetime type of transaction. And so they, you know, making sure that they understand what's going on, um, you know, get, getting educated, getting the right advisors to get that education um, will truly give a better sense of, you know, expectations, timeline, deadlines, things like that. And another question, what rate of return is private equity looking to get out of a medical practice slash group? What is their goal, timeline, exit, or liquidity event for their investors? And so first, first and foremost, private equity firms generally are looking to create a return of about three to five times on their invested equity in a transaction. And that, that three to five times return, it, it, it holds true for all shareholders of the business. So within the, the rolled equity component that we discussed during the presentation, that seeks to uh, benefit from that same appreciation and value. Their goal is to exit in, in kind of a three to seven year period. Transactions are, are the lifespan of them can be very different. And if you remember the, during the presentation, the um, ophthalmology deal that we did in 2014 with Cats and I Group, that transaction lasted about three years. It was actually recapitalized for a second time by a new private equity firm, Avista Capital Partners, or, or Harvest Capital Partners, apologies, um, in June of this year. So that transaction took about three years. And National Spine and Pain, which we did in 2011, was actually recapitalized in the same month, June of this year. So that transaction took about five and a half to six years uh, with, with Avista Capital Partners. So those organizations both grew, uh, you know, a substantial amount in that time period, but the lifespan can, can differ. So generally anywhere from that three to seven year period. Uh, another one, what are the pros and cons of joining Gastro Health and Audax versus pursuing a different private equity partner? Um, the answer would, would be different depending on, um, you know, what organization you are. Uh, if you have the infrastructure and the uh, capability and the, the providers and the, the ancillary service breadth to become a platform on your own, um, it, it might make a lot of sense to become your own, your own platform with a new private equity partner. Um, there's also, I mean, the transactions can be very different in, in terms of how you structure them. Um, in a transaction like that, you'd obviously want to keep Gastro Health and Audex uh, involved in the process just to, to kind of, um, they are definitely a, a willing, you know, acquirer for a lot of, a lot of groups out there. And, um, you know, our perspective is that as they move up that private equity, um, you know, pyramid that we discussed earlier, they're going to be looking to move into other regional markets around the country. So we've seen before, for instance, our, our client, again, uh, Cats and I Group, which was the foundation for eye care services partners. Um, that organization is an umbrella of a bunch of different ophthalmo ophthalmology practices around the country nationally. So you, you, there, there could be a similar situation like that where you're, you're using uh, an established platform, which would be one of the, the pros of, of joining a gas relevant products, maybe under a different, you know, under a different name. So you, you may not have to go under the exact you know, gas relevant moniker. Um, and then, you know, that's obviously one of the cons, though, is that things would, would definitely be a little different and it's, it's um, a little more in, invasive than just using your own private equity partner. But again, the biggest pro would be, especially for a small organization, um, maybe not platform caliber, is that you can, you can leverage, uh, the, you know, the, the infrastructure and resources of a large organization to one, um, provide a better quality of care to your patients because you have access to those ancillary you know, services, as well as using that infrastructure and, and going back to just focusing on practicing medicine as, as, instead of the administrative functions of, of your organization. So we have about two minutes left. Um, we have time for potentially one more question if anyone would like to submit any additional questions. Okay, well, not seeing any, 
then we can go ahead and um, wrap up. But if you have any questions and you'd like to follow up with our presenters following the webinar, their contact information is displayed on this slide. Uh, in two to three business days, I will send a link to the webinar recording and slides to all registrants. Um, so you will have that information available following today's webinar. And with that, I'd like to thank Abe and Anjana for their time and thank everyone for joining us.